Grace to you and peace. It has been about six months since my last video. On Sunday, June 2nd, there was just so much to include in the worship hour and really not enough time for everything. So now I'm making another video. I'm Pastor Dave, presently serving Clarksburg United Methodist Church and Wesley Chapel United Methodist Church, both of them in the Baltimore, Washington Annual Conference. Um, near the county line between Montgomery County and Frederick County. In this video, I'm going to be offering some thoughts regarding the lectionary lessons for June 2nd. And these lectionary lessons I will be offering to you by means of my own paraphrase. If you've seen my other videos, you know that the reason that I do this is in order to respect the copyrights owned by others. I do invite you to compare my paraphrase with a good contemporary uh, English translation or translation in your own language, whatever that may be. There are many good translations and a good source for comparing translations uh, is BibleGateway.com. I highly recommend it. Let's pray as we begin. Holy God, let the wind of your spirit move among us today as we hear your word. May we become energized to do your will. Your loving grace is the wellspring for all we will do. Your Spirit's work is to instruct us, pointing us to Christ, and proving everything worldly to be wrong. May we respond in faith. May our lives be living letters, proclaiming by our deeds the good news of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First reading I'd like to share with you is the one from... 1 Samuel chapter 3. In the days when Eli was priest, serving the people of Israel at the shrine of the Lord God at Shiloh, Samuel was a boy, also serving there, under the training and supervision of Eli. It was a time when it seemed the Lord God spoke infrequently, and very few people experienced visions. Eli's eyesight had gotten very bad, and on this particular occasion he had gone to bed in his room. The lamp of God was still burning, and Samuel had a bed within the shrine where the ark of God was. There the Lord God called out, calling Samuel by name. Thinking Eli was calling him, Samuel ran to Eli, giving the expected response when called, Here I am. But Eli denied summoning him and told Samuel just to go back to bed, which Samuel did. Again the Lord God called out to Samuel by name, and Samuel reported again to Eli, saying, Here I am, for you called me. Again Eli denied summoning him, and told Samuel just to go back to bed, which Samuel did. All of this was a new experience for Samuel. The Lord God had never before spoken to him in this way. Now the Lord God called Samuel a third time, so he got up and he reported to Eli yet again. He said, Here I am, for you called me. Old blind Eli realized that the Lord God was calling the boy. And so he instructed Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel again returned to his bed. The Lord entered and, standing there, called Samuel by name, just like before. So Samuel replied, just as he'd been instructed, Speak, for your servant is listening. So the Lord God revealed to Samuel the things that would soon take place, saying, People will be shocked. They won't be able to believe what they're hearing. I've warned Eli that his family would suffer because of the immoral behavior of his sons. Because of them, my reputation is being dragged through the mud. Since Eli has done nothing, I will act. There is no sacrifice that will atone. There is no offering that will make me relent. Eli's family is through representing me forever. Samuel didn't sleep the rest of the night, remaining awake there in his bed until morning light, at which time he opened the doors of the house of the Lord God at Shiloh. Samuel was afraid to share with Eli what God had revealed to him. But Eli summoned Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. In respect, Samuel replied, Here I am. 
And Eli demanded that Samuel tell him everything the Lord God had said, threatening Samuel with punishment from God if he left anything out. So, concealing nothing, Samuel revealed to Eli all that the Lord God had revealed to him. Eli replied, It is the Lord. The Lord will do as the Lord sees to be good. As Samuel grew up, the Lord God was with him, and every message Samuel proclaimed was reliable. From the far north to the far south, everyone in Israel had confidence in Samuel as the prophet of the Lord God. The Gospel lesson for June 2nd was Mark chapter 2, verse 23, through Mark chapter 3, verse 6. One Sabbath, the journey of Jesus and his disciples went through grain fields. And as they walked, the disciples were plucking some grain, and the Pharisees began to challenge Jesus, saying that what the disciples were doing was a violation of the Sabbath. Jesus replied with a story from the scriptures, reminding them that David had once found sanctuary with Abiathar, who was high priest. Since David and his companions were hungry, the bread on the altar was taken for them to eat. Now, no one was supposed to eat this bread except for the priests. Jesus then said, God had given the Sabbath to humans as a gift to serve them suggesting that the Pharisees had gotten things backwards, and saying that the Sabbath is not Lord over us, but rather the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. After this, Jesus entered the synagogue, where he was met by a man who had a hand he could not use. Jesus' critics were watching to see what Jesus would do, thinking that if Jesus did something to help this man on the Sabbath, then they'd have sufficient cause to charge Jesus as one who did not observe the law of Moses. Jesus invited the man to approach him, and Jesus asked those who had gathered, What is it we may do on the Sabbath? May we do good or do harm? May we save lives or destroy them? Which is it? No one would answer his question. Jesus looked at everyone quite upset, and sorrowing because they had no compassion. Jesus then said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Now, these critics who were experts in the law began to conspire with some of those in Israel who supported the rule of Herod. They were looking for a way to destroy Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Again, let's pray. O God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out upon us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that, being taught by you and Holy Scripture, our hearts and minds may be opened to know the things that pertain to life and holiness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the notes below this video, you're going to find a couple of links. One of our bishops offered a couple of pastoral letters this past week that I appreciated, and one concerned being careful about what we teach our children, both by what we say and by how we live. You can find that video, as I mentioned, linked below. You can also find another one dated on Friday of last week, and it concerned our nation's polarization and the recent conviction of a former president on charge of business fraud. Business fraud in the effort to influence an election. I have shared a link to that video on my Facebook page. The link is also in the notes below this video. You'll find it there. I encourage you to read these pastoral responses from one of our bishops. So in the next few minutes today, I'd like to share a few thoughts about these two lectionary lessons that I've shared with you today, and then add one more to the mix. First, with regard to the reading from Samuel, it's a problem text. 
While there is good in the text with the boy being open to hearing a word from the Lord, and then throughout his ministry being faithful and handling what he had heard from God, as I read it, there is a portion of the text from which it is proper for us to recoil today. In fact, I would suggest if such a thing were to take place today, then that leader should be removed from their office of responsibility. Eli threatened Samuel, saying, May God deal with you ever so severely and worse if you don't tell me everything God said to you. Now, by our standards today, I believe that such threats are spiritual abuse. As the text stands, it tells us that God was removing Eli and his family from a position of power and responsibility, though not for this threat to a boy in his care, but because his sons were doing evil, and though he knew it, he had done nothing to restrain them. Now, there's another difficult aspect to the text, and that is that it declares no forgiveness possible for the house of Eli or his descendants forever. That is really harsh, and I would suggest it does not seem consonant with the God of love that we meet in the person of Jesus. Note the message to Eli, though. To permit evil is to be complicit. To say nothing when injustice is done is to become part of it. We know something about such complicity in our own day. We hear about it in the quote from Martin Niemöller that is so widely spread. He talked about his own failure to speak up against the crimes of Nazi Germany. He said, first they came for the socialists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. I didn't speak up. I wasn't a trade unionist. They came for the Jews, and again I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. We see this complicity issue also in the assertion of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, there comes a time when silence is betrayal. And, from Leonard Peltier, in his prison writings, uh, it's entitled, My Life is My Sun Dance, he wrote, silence, they say, is the voice of complicity. But silence is impossible. Silence screams. Silence is a message, just as doing nothing is an act. Let who you are ring out and resonate in every word and every deed. Yes, become who you are. There's no sidestepping your own being or your own responsibility. What you do is who you are. You are your own comeuppance. You become your own message. You are the message. Silence, yes, is complicity. To remain <laughs> passive in the face of injustice is to enable that injustice. So, are we willing, as was Samuel in this text today, to hear the word of the Lord and then to handle it faithfully? Are we willing to become the message? The gospel presents some questions for us as well. In Jesus, we find that the word of God takes on flesh, and the eternal word, making his home in our midst for a while, speaks with us, teaches us, reveals God to us. Are we willing to listen carefully and to learn? In the first part of this gospel reading, we find Jesus saying that exigent circumstances may permit setting aside the clear letter of the law. David was not a priest, but in exigent circumstances, he ate the bread that only priests were permitted to eat. So also, on this Sabbath, Jesus suggests it's okay for the disciples, in the exigent circumstances of ministry, in order to keep their strength up, to do what otherwise might be considered work. 
the work of harvesting grain and preparing it for human consumption. It's not that the Sabbath doesn't matter. It's not that what we do on the Sabbath doesn't matter. Jesus is not a scoff law. But what matters are the human exigencies, the emergent situations, the pressing needs, the urgent demands. How will we respond? And so, when the person in need of healing appears before Jesus on the Sabbath, in the synagogue, for Jesus, there's one question. Will he be complicit with evil? The person's illness or disability is oppressing him. Will he be complicit or will he do what he can to relieve that person? Sometimes there's no middle ground. Silence is complicity. Inaction empowers the oppressor. Now some were offended by his message. You and I, we are people of God, children of God, family of God. We have a treasure, the good news, the gospel. We are human. We will make mistakes. So did Samuel. Still, as we attempt to be faithful, as we remember the command we have to love God and to love neighbor, as we remember the commission we are given to share the good news and make the disciples, as we remember, as our lives become the message, God will be faithful and display God's power. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5-7, through 7, Our preaching is not about us, but about Jesus, that he is God's anointed and that he is Lord. We're merely your servants. The divine initiated light when all was darkness, and the same Lord God now has brought light into our hearts and lives by revealing God's own glory in the person of Jesus Christ. This gift of God is a priceless treasure that now is contained in mere pottery vessels, vessels made from earth, our lives. And that contrast proves that the power you experience is from God, not from us. Today, our scripture lessons invite us into discipleship. The example of Samuel, being faithful to the messages with which he was entrusted, summons us to hear the word of God and to respond to it, and then to share it with all who need it. The reading from the Gospel tells us that legalism is not what our faith is about. Rather, we're to respond in compassion with Jesus and to deal with the needs of the moment. We're not to become scoff laws, but neither are we to allow our narrow understanding of what seems to be a scriptural ordinance of God to prevent us from engaging in doing good. Let me say that again. We're not to become scoff laws, but neither are we to allow our narrow understanding of what seems to be a scriptural ordinance from God to prevent us from engaging in doing good. To fail to do good as opportunity presents is to become complicit with the oppressive structures of our world. Again, I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, we pray for your Holy Church Universal, that you would be pleased to fill it with all truth in all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is an error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, establish it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of him who died and rose again, and ever lives to make intercession for us, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch my short video on the scriptures for June 2nd. We, uh, we meet weekly, in person, 9.30 at Wesley Chapel in Urbana, 11 o'clock at Clarksburg United Methodist Church on Spire Street in Clarksburg. You'd be most welcome to join us.